Hi, we're here with Mosen Imani. He's the winner of the January Jacobs Graduate Student Council Award. Mosen is a graduate student researcher from the Computer Science and Engineering Department, and he's currently working on emerging computer field. Can you explain to us what that feel like or really what, what it means? Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, during my PhD, I work on uh, three main projects uh, related to actually computer architecture and how we can design a new uh, computing systems that they are more energy efficient and faster. So uh, the first project, I want to briefly describe uh, all projects here. The first project is about approximate computing. Uh, although technology has significantly uh, ch uh, changed uh, during the last three decades, the human precision, visual actually ability, to preserve the information and uh, respond to that, it hasn't changed during thousand years. So in today's computers, we do not actually really need high precision computation. Especially for a task that computer directly works with human, we can work with significantly uh, lower precision, but provide order of magnitude higher energy efficiency and faster computation. In fact, approximate computing actually trade the accuracy in order to get a much higher energy efficiency. So the level of approximation should be determined depending on the application and user. So we design a, a platform which adaptively changes the level of approximation depending on three factors. Depending on application, depending on a user requirement, and uh, depending on a user context. But the second project that I work on that is about uh, processing in memory. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, the current computing system, uh, they are not really efficient in order to process uh, big data. And the reason is that the uh, traditional von Neumann architectures, they have been designed such that they have pretty small caches next to the each processing course. And then there is a hierarchy of a memory, and they have a really big memory, which is your SSD, or flash memory. So, uh, when the uh, workload is going to process on this uh, traditional architecture, uh, the data needs to go from the uh, big memory that you have, like SSD, up to the processing core, and after that, is stored in a caches. And then processing cores, they can locally process the data. These architecture are pretty efficient when they want to process a small data or data which has really high locality. But if your data uh, is really big and it just feeds on like your really big memory, you need to serially process that in a processing core. Instead of that, uh, people try to bring the memory, their computing unit, close to the memory. Uh, but actually we observe that this kind of architecture, they, they are not very efficient and they are pretty expensive because designing a, a processor at the top of memory, it has extra cost and also still your the bandwidth, your, like I can say, parallelism, it will be limited by the number of cores you have. So, in a state of that, we are actually designing a new platform with the name of processing in memory, which enables the memory by itself to have some basic and essential capability of doing computation. So, we don't uh, actually practically changing a memory architecture, we are just exploiting the analog characteristics of memory in order to uh, support some essential operation. For example, we support search operation, we support bitwise operation and uh, addition multiplication internally in memory and based on these operations, we can accelerate application on memory. So we can accelerate a part of application or we can entirely run one application inside the memory we have. So. Actually, we, uh, for this architecture that we have, we tried different type of big, big data application. We had applications from graph processing that they are a most commonly data structure used on social media, for example, on Facebook, on Instagram, LinkedIn. And uh, our result shows that the architecture that we have, it can accelerate the uh, graph processing applications by two order of magnitudes which is going to be like 100 times faster than uh, existing computers. And we also apply this kind of uh, processing in memory architectures to machine learning and how we can accelerate deep neural network in both training and inference inside the memory without using any processing core. So the entire application can run uh, inside the memory. 
Oh, I was also during your CV that you're working on brain-inspired uh, computing. Can you tell a bit more about this, how you're using these bio-inspired principles to design in computer principles? Oh, yeah. The third project that I work on that, it was about uh, brain-inspired computing. The idea was about how we can design a computer which works like a human brain. When we deeply actually look at the spec of a machine and human, we can we can we are surprised. So if you look at the machine, you can see uh, the machine used thousand CPUs, hundred GPUs, and it consumes one megawatt power consumption. While a human power consumption, the brain is in order of twenty watt. So it it means that the machines are consuming fifty thousand times more energy power than like a human. So. If we want to design a new machine, actually, which works like a brain, we should have we should consider some features. So we are designing a brain in a spirit computing, which at first it should be a low power. It should consume uh, some power like a human brain, and it should have a high robustness to the noise and failure. The two more important factors that we need to we consider when we are designing a new machine uh, is that the machine should be highly parallel like a human brain, and it should have learnability. We are working uh, in particular on hyperdimensional computing, so in collaboration with UC Berkeley and Stanford University. And the idea is about how we can perform the computation using really long vectors. The vectors that the pattern of the uh, vectors, the I can say the distribution of values inside this vector, it uh, represents a value or object. So if I want to explain more, I can give you one example. When I'm looking at the white color, for example, now, so a chemical reaction happens in my brain, which neuroscience, they show that my uh, virtual cortex, the neurons on my virtual cortex, they get the specific distribution. So when I'm looking at a black color or different color, this distribution is completely orthogonal to the first distribution. It means that uh, my brain identifies the object we, uh, and show them using a pattern of a value in 10,000 or 1 million dimension. So we inspired the same idea and we tried to design a random vectors and based on uh, for each color, for example, if it's an image, and we combine these images and these call vectors in order to identify, for example, one object. So by combination of vector, I can identify what is a pixel, Oh, so do you have in mind any particular uh, uh, field where you are interested in applying these developments you're making in brain-inspired computation? Uh, thanks for uh, your great question, actually. So in the C-Lab, System Energy Efficient Laboratory, that I'm working on that, uh, we are trying to apply a hyperdimensional computing to different cognitive tasks. So we already have a implementation of hyperdimensional computing on a classification problem. Regardless of data type, we can enable classification like voice classification, image classification, or work with recognition like text recognition and so on. Also, we can support unsupervised learning application like clustering. Recently, we developed our code for applying regression problem and even recommendation system. And uh, our framework that we have now, uh, it has very interesting characteristics. It supports, uh, during learning, it supports one-shot learning. So we don't need to go iteratively through the training data in order to perform the cognitive task. And also, uh, since the encoding mapping to the high-dimensional space, it's non-linear, we can perform the rest of classification or cognitive task using linear algebra. So it means that we can run significantly more efficient compared to the previous approaches. And also, our uh, encoding is reversible. So it means that when we, I'm encoding data to high-dimensional space, whenever that I want, I can return the data back to original data. I can use it for secure storage. But we have proven, we, have, we had collaboration with uh, Professor Farinas Kushanfar at ECE, and we have shown that the hyperdimensional encoding, when we map the data to high-dimensional space, it can be secure. Meaning that I can encode my data to high-dimensional space, and uh, I can make sure that nobody will understand what is the original data by looking at this hypervector. And we use this kind of information in order to enable secure collaborative learning, where there are, when there are multiple, for example, people in this room, and they want to share the information with the cloud, 
which is untrusted, we can all encode our data using hyperdimensional computing, send our information to the cloud. Cloud can create a model without understanding each individual value. Even I, as a user, if I attack the cloud, I cannot understand uh, what's the information of other people there. I can just understand my data. And using that, cloud creates a uniform uh, model and it sends it back to each individual node, which is uh, the users that we are. Well, this works seems really interesting. Do you have any partnerships with industries or it's more an academic job what you're doing? Uh, oh, really good question, actually. So it was about two years ago that I uh, work on a, uh, I led a, a group of like six, seven PhD students and with, uh, supervise, with my supervisor, Professor Tyner Rosing, we wrote a proposal for semiconductor research cooperation and about the same topic, a proposal about the same topic. Semiconductor Research Corporation is an organization which get money from the industry and the companies and the project uh, was in, actually it was with other universities and even other faculties at UCSD and this project has been funded by 40 million dollars for five years and we just passed the first year uh, in this January. Oh, it's, it's pretty great that uh, you have been working on very different diverse fields on uh, new ways of computing, emerging computing. But just as uh, curiosity, how many publications have you gotten from all this work during your PhD? Uh, the result of my PhD has been published in over 90 pa papers in top tier conferences and journals. I have published several papers in uh, different venues, including computer architecture conferences, electronic design automation conferences, and also recently on system level conferences like cloud computing. If I want to talk about my mentorship too, during my PhD, I directly mentor more than 30 undergraduate and 15 graduate students, including eight PhD students. My uh, mentorship was uh, over just making students busy with the research, which is old or never useful. I uh, train my students to be on the edge of science. As a result of mentorship, I have published uh, about 27 papers with undergraduate students where 18 of them are with actually underrepresentative students, especially uh, mostly actually female students uh, in engineering. Uh, beside my volunteer uh, mentorship that I had, I explained, I have uh, participated in several programs that aim to increase the number of undergraduate students uh, at UCSD. Uh, for example, I mentored about 10 students from ERSP program that uh, tries to increase the number of uh, undergraduate students at UCSD CSE department. In addition, I mentored several students from England's program that aim to increase the Latino student at UCSD. Uh, I always try to encourage my uh, undergraduate students uh, and give them this actually confidence to apply for graduate school. Uh, I'm so glad that eight of my students, undergrads, that they wanted to join company after the bachelor, they decided to actually go graduate program based on the research they have done with me. And I have uh, students who joined, for example, University of Pennsylvania for PhD program, UC Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, and many of them, they stayed at UCSD. I also had a chance uh, of teaching two courses at uh, UCSD during uh, like summer 2017. I was teaching CSE 140D and 140L that we, I had over uh, like 100 students in each class. Um, and now after uh, teaching experience and mentorship students, I believe that uh, this, is, uh, the this is what I want to do during my career, for my career. And I want to stay in academia. I want to be more involved in undergraduate research, uh, not only at UCSD, even, uh, but also in a maybe entire UC. And I want, uh, I'm looking for a, a research-oriented faculty position next year, and I hope I can, be, uh, I can have a more actually significant impact in near future. Oh, with all the great work you're doing and your great teaching and mentorship, I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to get all this. Thank great, you so a, much. a great job, and you'll be able to really exploit the new way of doing computing. Thanks. Again, congratulations on the award, and hope you the best for the future. Thank you.